Mm-hmm. And then one day, um, I kept seeing this black SUV drive around. I was like, what in the world is this black SUV? It looked like the police out here. And then so I saw a door open and I saw a, a black umbrella pop up. And then I saw a lady with like all white on and she walked into the barbershop. And I'm like, who in the world is this? And then she walked in and she was like, oh, hey, Mr. Reed. Talked to my granddad. He was like, oh, hey, Oprah, how you doing, baby? Welcome to the Life Balance Mentor Podcast with Kurt Warner. Learn how to create balance in your life as a busy entrepreneur. Gain insights into improving and growing your business and establishing routines that help balance all aspects of life. Listen to the Life Balance Mentor Podcast to get the kickstart you need every week. Welcome to another episode of the Life Balance Mentor Podcast. I'm your Life Balance Mentor, Kurt Warner. This week, I have the pleasure of having an exciting guest, Tony Reed, on. And let me tell you a little bit about Tony. So Tony is a young, ambitious entrepreneur who got his start at a very young age. His granddad sparked his entrepreneurial spirit by setting up a lemonade stand for Tony in their driveway when he was young, which I'm going to ask Tony about and get the details on that. But really what happened when he turned 18, Tony's granddad gave him a gift that would change his life, an incredible piece of commercial property. This property actually caught the eye of the one and only Oprah Winfrey and her family who were looking for land to develop their dream apartment complex. Seizing this major opportunity, and without a license, made Tony realize that mindset and customer service are more important than anything else. Tony decided then and there to focus on becoming a better version of himself rather than just honing his knowledge base. Today, Tony is known for his playful personality and dedication to helping others develop and grow. So welcome to the Life Balance Mentor Podcast, Tony. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kurt, for having me. So, Tony, it, very interesting. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs that I hear have a moment in life that really kind of changes for them and shows them, you know, this is the direction I want to go. So let's start off with the early days and the lemonade stand and kind of other things that happened maybe early on in your life that sparked that interest to become an entrepreneur. Absolutely. And that's a fantastic question right there, Kurt. So with that, so I was born in uh, 1985 and I was already born into a family who was used to abundance and used to the entrepreneurial spirit. So my granddad, um, he's the eighth generation barber in our family. So my whole entire family, all we done at that time was just barber, barber, barber. So when I was born, Kurt, in the 80s, I was born with a pair of clippers inside of my crib. You know, I didn't have a pacifier or anything like that. Because my granddad, my whole life, he's been telling me, you know, you're going to be a barber. You're going to take over the barbershop. So Mm -hmm. when I was three, I've always shown the ambitious entrepreneur mindset because my granddad, that's what he grew me to do. He trained me to do that since since a young boy. And when I was three, I was like, daddy, because I called my granddad my dad. So I said, daddy, can you bid me a lemonade stand in the driveway? He was like, uh, yeah. So we went out to Home Depot and Lowe's and got, you know, the wood and screws and things like that. Then we would go out to um, Sam's Club and get like the lemon and and stuff like that where I could squeeze them and make them. So all of the neighbors were so enthused by my entrepreneurial spirit at such a young age, they would come by and give me like, you know, 25, 30 cents for a cup of lemonade. So I would make, you know, 10, 15 bucks at three or four years old. And then so moving the story forward, when I was about five, my granddad was like, OK, son, you know, now you know how to make money. You know how to will and deal with people, because that's one of the key things in life, knowing how to work with people. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I want to get you over to the family barbershop. So what I done there, Kurt, I started dusting the backs off of the gentleman's hair. Up. When they get their hair cut, I would clean them up and you know, get shaved and stuff. And they would tip me like a dollar or five or sometimes 20 bucks. And so that just sparked my Definite entrepreneurial spirit, because now it's in like the 90s now, like, you know, like 1990, something like that now. And I'm like, wow. So I'm going to elementary school, Kurt, and I had like a pocket full of legit money. (laughs) And it made me feel so good. And then when I turned 14, so I worked at the barbershop from like five to like 14. Mm -hmm. Then my granddad, um, he has sugar diabetes, like really, really bad. And he had like uh, like an attack. And then he had passed out and he was like, son, um, I, I can't do this anymore here. Uh, I need for you to step up to the plate, step up to home plate, swing the bat and knock the ball out the park for the family. Keep the family name going. 
So I was like, okay, I have to do this. This is my family. You know, my family I always had my back my whole life. So I have to keep the name going. And then so at that point, my granddad was like, son, the business is yours. And that's how I got off into doing the barbering. Awesome. So at 14, that's a lot of responsibility to take on. I know it it happens in some circumstances. Obviously, you know, things in life do happen. You have to step up. But in that moment, do you remember how you felt? Like, did you feel a sense of pride? Or was there fear? Like, what was going through your mind and heart at that time? All the emotions, Kurt, that you mentioned, like fear, like I said, like, you know, just all kind of things. Like, the main thing I was really thinking, Kurt, was like, I have a lot of pressure on me. Like, I have like the Reed family name. It's like, I'm the 10th generation because my dad, he's the ninth. I'm the 10th. I'm like, I have a lot of pressure riding on me right here. Like, if I drop the bottle on this at 14, my family, we could possibly be over, you know. So I need to make sure I'm focused, get my mindset together, start meditating, start doing the proper things in life so I can really scale our business up even higher. I think that's something that um, entrepreneurs of any age kind of go through. Is It's that moment, that decision point where, you know, I need to do this. I need to make a decision. And regardless of the fear, regardless of the doubt, regardless of anything else, it's this is the time to actually push through and make this happen. So that's awesome at, at such a young age doing that. So what was it like, you know, fast forward a little bit and now you, you're taking over, you know, you know, running the running the shop at 14. What were the next like, you know, five, six years like for you being in that position? Because you're still in school at the time. Yes. And that's a really good question, Kurt. So what that would look like would be I would wake up, you know, go to school. And then as soon as I would come from school, I would catch the bus over to the barbershop and I would just be at the shop just working from like 315 when I got out of school and then up until like about seven, eight o'clock at night. So I was pretty tired back in those early days, Kurt, like because I was going to school and working. And mm -hmm. but the crazy thing is, Kurt, at that time. I didn't even have a barber's license at that time, but I could get away with that because that was my granddad's shop. I couldn't be at, you know, somebody else's shop without a license doing that because that's a huge fine. And I can admit that now, but I didn't even have a license at that time, Kurt. And then so when I turned um, 18, my granddad was like, OK, son, you know, you're a grown man now. Now it's time to go and get your actual barber's license so you can really start making money. Mm hmm. So what happened after you got the license? Did you then, you know, continue with your granddad shop? Did you take it over or did you go and start your own kind of thing? Good question. So, no, I continue with my granddad's shop. So after I got up out of a barber college and got my actual license. So what I done was I just continued to work at the shop and just kind of hone and more so perfect my craft. Mm -hmm. And then one day um, I kept seeing this black SUV drive around. I was like, what in the world is this black SUV? It looked like the police out here. And then so I saw a door open and I saw a, a black umbrella pop up. And then I saw a lady with like all white on and she walked into the barbershop. And I was like, who in the world is this? And then she walked in and she was like, oh, hey, Mr. Reed. Talked to my granddad. He was like, oh, hey, Oprah, how you doing, baby? Then he was like, oh, hey, uh, this is my grandson right here, Lil T. He working in here now. Oprah was like, oh, hey, little Ree, how you doing? I'm like, oh, hey, Miss Oprah, how you doing? Because, see, a lot of people don't uh, know, Kurt. See, Oprah's father's barbershop is 150 foot across the street from our barbershop. Oh, so wow. my whole life, I've been knowing Oprah my whole life. So, but I didn't know who she was when she got out the SUV with that umbrella with her head down, with a bodyguard walking. And so at that time, about mm, maybe six months before that, Kurt, my granddad was like, son, you know, you're doing really good. You know, you're doing what you're supposed to do in life. You know, um, I've been grooming you, training you to be a businessman, to be an entrepreneur and everything. So at that time, Kurt, my grandfather owned 55 pieces of property and he had like 15 commercial pieces of property. Mm -hmm. So one of the commercial pieces of property was um, connected on to the backside of the barbershop. It had like, so our barbershop is the barbershop, it's the alley, and then it's like a big 300 foot building right there. Mm -hmm. That was the building that my grandfather gave me. And so he was like, you know, you're doing good. So this is my gift to you. So we went down, you know, did quick claim and everything and boop, everything was mine and legally in my name. And then so when Oprah came in a few months later, 
she was like, oh, yeah, hey, Mr. Reed, um, whose beard is this right here? Then my granddad pointed to me. He was like, that's his. So I'm like, you know, and then so I'm looking like I'm getting like it. Now it's a bit from like Oprah Renfrey. Yes, I've been knowing her my whole life, but it's different. And she actually is physically talking to me more so than like seeing her and stuff like that. And she was like, would you be interested in selling this building? And at first, Kurt, I was like, no, ma'am, not at all. Yeah. My, my granddaddy gave it to me. So she was like, OK, OK, no problem. And then maybe about eight months later, she came back and she was like, can I talk to you? I said, I was like, yes, ma'am. And then she was like, I want to make you a really good deal on this building. And Kurt, um, I must say, um, I was like, daddy, I'll be right back. Let me go down to the bank. Let me go sign these deeds and stuff like that. <laughs> because she just got this building from me and everything. And what they was trying to do, Kurt, see, at this time, it may have been about 2007, 2008, something like that. And in Tennessee, um, they were really doing like the gentrification thing. And um, it was the area was more like a, I'm not going to say a dilapidated area, but it wasn't like a very well upkept area at that time. And mm -hmm. they were trying to really develop it. So Mr. Winfrey, Oprah's father, he just passed away here recently, you know, um, but he was like, you know what? I want to build an apartment complex. And yeah. he was a very forward thinker, Kurt. He was thinking things like, I want to have a business at the bottom and put apartments at the top. You know, kind of, I, I've seen that when I went to New York, but at that time, I've never seen that in Tennessee. Wasn't well, nobody thinking like that in Tennessee. And so he showed Oprah the building and then she came in and we made the deal. So that's how the family purchased the building from me, Kurt. Wow. Wow. So how long did you actually own that property before it, you sold it? Maybe six, seven months, eight months max. That is unbelievable. Yeah, that, that's that's amazing. And I do want to ask you a question because obviously, you know, starting at a very young age at three with a lemonade stand, going into the barber shop when you're five and helping out, taking over at 14, selling land to Oprah Winfrey, you know, when you're 18, 19 years old. What is the mindset that you think it takes to for somebody to be an entrepreneur? Because you know, you've had that since you were young before you even knew what being an entrepreneur was. So what is that mindset that you think it, it takes for somebody to have to, to go out and do it? To me, Kurt, the perfect mindset would be when you know you can do it. See, if you set your mind to anything in your life, it doesn't matter what it is. You can do it. If you think you can and you think you can't, then you can't. You know, that's one of those old sayings right there. And when I heard that, Kurt, I was like, you know what? I know I can do this. Yes, I'm very intimidated right now. Very, because, you know, this is like the richest woman in the world. And so I was like, you know, but I don't need to lose sight of my mind. I don't need to get overly excited or nothing like that. Because see, a lot of entrepreneurs, when someone like Oprah is in your presence, they get overly excited. They kind of get to fiddling and fumbling and kind of making moves that are like irrational. So as long as you know you could do it and as long as you know that you are capable of doing it and don't let anything else get in your way. Because, see, one thing, Kurt, this is when I got off into meditation. And that's one huge thing I do. And at this time, I was meditating like 30 minutes a day. Now I meditate two hours a day now, you know, an hour in the morning, an hour at night. But at this time, I was, you know, a little bit younger and a little less schooled on meditation. So the perfect mindset to be able to have that entrepreneur mindset when a situation like that arises would be just to know you can do it. Get your mind together. Don't lose sight of focus. Meaning when you wake up, don't immediately grab your telephone because normally it's going to be negativity on your phone. And then if you get that negative mindset and then someone like over a Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos asked to buy your building. If you are to have that negative mindset, you're going to be thinking, Oh, this, this is a terrible thing. And you could miss a golden opportunity. So just seize the golden opportunities. Know you can do it and always have your mind together. So speaking about routines, um, obviously meditating in the morning, you know, for an hour, I think it's very important what you said about not just reaching for your phone, which is very difficult for a lot of people to do because it's like the first thing. And, and that can be messages that came in overnight. It could be emails from, you know, work, emails about your business. Unfortunately, a lot of people now are turned right to social media and, you know, that does not have a positive impact on, on your day. So what does your morning routine look like? Really good question. 
So I'll wake up about six o'clock every morning and then from six to seven, I'm meditating. So like what I mean by that, I'm not sitting on like a pillow or anything like that. Not that type of meditate. What I'm what I call meditation is more so uh, projecting my day. So what I do, Kurt, as soon as I wake up, I set a one hour timer. During that time frame, I make up the bed, you know, jump in the shower, you know, shave and things like that. Now, I also tell my wife, like, hey, during this time, please don't disturb me. Don't, you know, ask anything, you know, anything like that. If the house is on fire, kind of get, <laughs> come and let me know. But other than that, you know, please don't disturb my meditative state because I need to do this to get my day set up. And then so what I'm doing, Kurt, I'm projecting my day. I'm like, OK, so what I have to do today, I have a meeting with Kurt. Then after this, I have to do a client. I'm more so kind of putting all the pieces of my day together. Then when I get done meditating, what I do, I journal for five minutes because to me, journaling my thoughts. But when I journal, Kurt, I journal in such a way that I'm journaling like, OK, like, you know, so I have a million dollar mansion. You know, I have this. I have that. I have this car. Not like when I journal, Kurt, I don't write things like I want this. I journal, I have the million dollar mansion, the 10,000 square foot house. I have that Lamborghini Gallardo. I have that. And what that does is it kind of seems like a little delusional, but it's really not. What that's doing is that's foreseeing my life and that's bringing abundance into my life even more. Because mm -hmm. if I can project myself where I want to be, I'm going to take the proper actions I need to do to get there. Yeah, and I think that's awesome because um, I don't know if you ever read, read Thinking Grow Rich from Napoleon Hill, mm -hmm. but um, he has a statement of desire. Um, now, in his book, he talked about um, you know writing that out, what you have, time frames, everything that was very much you have it, not you necessarily just want it, and reading it every day. So that practice is actually very important. It's like you're manifesting, you know your future life and saying you have it now. And a lot of times as, especially entrepreneurs, I think are trying to get to that place and whether it's financially, whether it's, um, you know, tangible assets or whether it's just where you want to feel and how you want to be as a person that if you're projecting, let's say, I want to be here in five years, or I want to have this in five years. Sometimes that's way too far out for people to actually maintain consistency to take the actions that, you know, will get them there or get them what they're after. So I think that's a great practice to write it down every day because you have that feeling as I have it. And I think you're also setting up your day amazingly by spending that first hour just meditating and you actually lived your day already in that first hour. Now it's just a matter of time passing by and that's it. So what's, what's the nighttime meditation? What do you do then? Is it more reflection or what is it that you do during that last hour? Absolutely. Good question. And like you mentioned, it's more so reflection. I kind of think about the things that I accomplished and the things that I didn't accomplish. I'm like, okay, well, that's going to be top priority tomorrow. So mm -hmm. if I needed to, let's just say, um, cut a YouTube video, you know, then if I didn't achieve that today because I was doing something else, the first thing I do the next day, that'd be top priority. So when I'm meditating, at that nighttime, I'm like, okay, so I didn't do my video this way. So in the morning, my brain is pre-pumped. So when I'm waking up halfway tired and showering to kind of wake up, my brain is already thinking from last night what I need to do that day. So that kind of helps boost my day. It's almost, it's almost like a shot of nitrous oxide. <laughs> so what was it or who was it that influenced you to actually start meditating? My grandmother. Okay. My grandmother. Yeah, she influenced me. Uh, so she used to listen to uh, our reverend. His name is Bishop Dupree. And he would always talk about meditation. But at that time, we would call it prayer. Yes. And he was like, you know, meditate, meditate. And I was like, real? What you mean meditate? Don't you mean pray? He was like, no, nah, son, it's a complete difference. I was like, what do you mean? And so by talking to him and by my grandmother, Listening to his practices, that's what kind of got me meditating. Awesome. So what age was it when you started kind of meditating? Maybe 12, 13-ish, something like that. So is this something that you also tell to other people or suggest other people to do and, you know, talking about the benefits of doing it? Absolutely, Kurt. That's one of the main key things that I teach uh, doing my uh, real estate trainings. 
That's the first thing I teach. I don't teach about how to sell or nothing like that. I'm also teach on how to be a better version of you because you can sell anything. But if you don't have that confidence or that mindset to know that you can do it, nothing else is going to work. It doesn't matter the car you have. It doesn't matter, you know, if you have lip injections. None of that matters. It's the, all, all that matters is if you know you can do it and take the proper action to get it going. Okay, so I want to go back to, um, you know, after Oprah purchased the property. What was the next thing? Because obviously that was probably a substantial purchase because you ran right away to make sure the deal got done. So what did you do next? I went down to, uh, well, actually, okay, so after I got that substantial deal, I got a limousine ride down to Bank of America. And at that time I was banking with Bank of America. So I got a limousine, Brian, and I had a friend come and pick up my car and drive my car back. Then when I got to Bank of America, I went in there with the briefcase and, you know, made a real nice deposit. And then after that, I was like, what do I want to do? And I'm not going to lie to you, Kurt. I'm not going to lie to you. So the next step that I done, and this is, I think this is something that any like young person would do. I went and bought a Lamborghini, Kurt. You know, it, it's one of those <laughs> things that Unless you have a very unique mindset at that age, again, put into perspective, you know, you're 18, 19 at the time to have a bunch of money. Yes, you're an entrepreneur. Yes, you understand, you know, business and you be in it, but you're still that age. And unless you have kind of mentors that say, okay, listen, hold off, delayed gratification, wait, you know, it's something that's going to happen. I know I heard Gary Vee say, several times that he spent his twenties, you know, working, you know, at his parents' wine shop, building that business, you know, six days a week and Sundays he'd watch football. And he said, the one regret he has is not actually taking time in his twenties to maybe every once in a while, go on vacation, hang out with his friends more. So, you know, you might reflect now and say, I wouldn't have done that now if that happens, but can't blame you. So outside of buying the car, what were the next steps? Okay. Outside of buying that, the next steps were me just to try to find different business opportunities. I knew I wanted to expand my life. I knew I wanted to do more than just be behind the chair for 10 hours, spinning people around and showing them the mirror. I knew I wanted to do more. And I was like, let me get a hair care business started. So I took some of that money, Kurt, and I got my hair care business started. And at that time, it was called Senior Teeth. And I was uh, making my hair care products in the kitchen and stuff like that. And I would sell them to the customers at our barbershop. And I made like a pretty good, pretty good amount of money doing that right there, Kurt. And then after that, I just, you know, started like, you know, just putting the money. At that time, I really wasn't too knowledgeable about banks or nothing like that. Uh, so I just started putting, you know, money in like savings accounts. Really wasn't getting a lot of interest or nothing like that. But I knew that I wanted to not blow any more money. Because that Lamborghini it was a substantial purchase. Yep. But as far as on that, I kept it for about a month and a half because the area that I lived in and worked in at that time, it wasn't a Lamborghini type of area. It kind of didn't fit. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, let me go get something else. Let me go and get a Toyota now. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so uh, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it right there, Kurt. So, so as far as on that one. So I'm going to ask you a question. Um, just you know, hearing your transitions you know, in your younger years, have you ever worked for somebody else? Yes. Yeah, okay. I did. I did. So when I was, um, so I, this is kind of something else I can continue on with you. Is this okay? So mm -hmm. once I, um, did my hair care thing. So this is around a time when I was like in my, going to like my mid twenties now, cause I had, you know, got a little bit more knowledgeable and now I had met my wife. And then she was just my girlfriend at that time. And I had a lot of negative events in life, Kurt, that happened to me that was like after the Oprah thing. So pre-Oprah, it was all flowers and daisies. But then after Oprah, it was like once people know you got a certain amount of money from a certain kind of person, you got certain leechers that try to lag on. Oh, I want to be with you. You know, oh, you're a good looking guy. Oh, you know. So things like that start happening, negative things like that, Kurt, start happening. And so some of my money started kind of dwindling away. And what wound up happening was my wife, and at the time she's my girlfriend, she was like, Tony, you have a, a hell of a story, man. Like, why don't you write a movie script 
about it. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote a movie script, I turned it in, came in third place out of 75,000 people. Wow. Uh, and then I flew from Tennessee out to L.A., you know, made some deals there, flew back to Tennessee and told my wife, baby, we're going to have to move out to the to the West Coast or whatnot because I got to pursue my film thing because me cutting hair for all of this time, it was cool, but I knew I could do more. And my hair care business is kind of going down a drain right now. I want to elevate my life more. And then so when I got out to the West Coast, Kurt, um, I did, you know, work for someone there because I didn't have my barber business. So I worked at an exotic car dealership. And then when I worked at the exotic car dealership, you know, to make extra money because, you know, the screenwriting thing, it was paying, but it wasn't giving me consistent money for me just to really live on. Because when you're writing movies, Kurt, you get a certain amount up front and then you get the back end of it once it's all produced. It's a whole shebang with that. So I knew I needed a continual income, kind of similar to the barbershop, because at the barbershop, I made cash every day. If I mm-hmm. cut your uh, hair, Kurt, and shave you, that's 27 bucks. That's mine right there. Then at the exotic car dealership, I sold a $85,000 car on my second date. And then wow. the manager was like, Tony, how in the world did you do that? <laughs> I was like, it was, it was easy, Alejandro. He was like, can you show people how to do that? I was like, yeah. And that right there, Kurt, is kind of what got me back into like that entrepreneurial spirit. I never really technically lost it, but I knew I didn't want to let my my wife and I go down being way away from Tennessee, 3000 miles away out in the West Coast, out in Cali, Arizona and stuff. So I'm like, I knew I can't go down. So I have to work for somebody. So, yes, I did. I did work for somebody, Kurt, but it was a little bit later on in my life. Even working with somebody, you pretty much immediately in a couple of days, turn that into kind of an entrepreneurial journey. And I think that's something, um, you know, for people that have jobs and that feel kind of stuck. Well, a lot of times you feel stuck because you're just showing up, you know, your boss, your employer says, be here at nine o'clock at five, you show up, you do the work and then you go. But if you come in with the mindset of, I want to create, I'm going to treat this role, this position as my own little business. And it doesn't matter if you're in marketing, if you're in sales, if you're in customer service, you can treat that role as your business. And I think what happens when you do that, when you show up to work differently, you show up because like, this is mine. I own this. How can I make this better? And similar to you, you know, selling the car and, and using, you know, your years experience of an entrepreneur and sales and just working with people and building relationships, utilizing your, your talents you're able to then not only sell a car and make commission, which you needed the money, but then it got recognized to say, Hey, can you teach other people? So is teaching something that you have a passion for? Absolutely. I love teaching people. I do. So what do you do right now in terms of teaching people? Like, or I know you talked about real estate training, obviously you've done well as an entrepreneur and sales. So where is it that you're focusing on now? Really good question. My focus now, Kurt, is more so to help people get their mindset together. Mm-hmm. So if you have the proper mindset, you can do and achieve anything. So I have a, a course, online course I have, um, I sell on my website. And I also have uh, two online courses on Udemy for like the a la carte and everything. Uh, have that. And then I also um, have a YouTube channel where I teach people about mindset and things like that, better communication and customer service. So those are going to be like my two main outlets where I teach at there. Okay. Awesome. Because I know when, you know, I was actually on your podcast, as you mentioned, uh, not too long ago, and we started talking, you know, about things that, you know, we are passionate about. Same. It's serving people, helping others, you know, really focused on mindset and, you know, personal growth and, you know, as soon as you said that, I'm like, okay, I need to have you on, on this podcast to be able to, you know, share your story. So I'll make sure that, you know, all the links and everything are in the podcast description. So people can get a hold of you, find you and continue growing. And, you know, one thing I appreciate about being in kind of this space of personal development, and I think I've seen it, um, you know, really with those that are kind of at those highest levels, like, you know, the Ed Milets, the Tony Robbins, um, the, uh, you know, Alex Ramoses, the Gary V's, and all these people that really try to inspire and encourage people. You know, I noticed, and Stephen Bartlett's another good one, um, but I noticed that they will appear in each other's podcast. They will support each other. 
It's not this sense of, I think what a lot of people have is scarcity mindset. It's like, Hey, if I'm going to do this real estate deal, I'll, I don't want to talk about it with another investor because they might try to take it. From me. You know, it's, it's really, you should have that mindset of abundance and help because the more people that, you know, we each can help, um, the more opportunity there is for everybody. So w- as soon as you said that, I'm like, come on, talk, share, and let's help as many people as we can. So I want to thank you for, for that. So make sure those links are there. So anybody listening can uh, definitely check you out. So where do you see your future going? Like what, you know, if you're looking five, 10 years out from now, where do you want to be? What do you want to grow to in terms of, you know, as a person, um, you know, as a husband, as an entrepreneur? Okay, really good question. So within the next five years, Kurt, my wife and I, we do want to have our first child. So we don't have any little ones now. We have little fur babies. But we do want to bring an actual child into the world. So that way, you know, we can, you know, you know, show it, you know, the kid and train it and everything to be a phenomenal person, just to be the best person it can be. Um, next, Kurt, what I want to achieve is to do like uh, live events and like different like uh, like concert halls and things like that, where I'm teaching about mindset. I'm teaching about creativity. I'm teaching about becoming a better you. So that's what I see within the next, you know, five years there, like my future. Okay. Awesome. Excellent. I'm going to ask you two final questions that I like to ask my guests. Um, I know we're a little bit into 2023, but I think it's, they're still really relevant uh, questions. The first one is, when you look back at 2022, is there one word that you would, could use to describe that year for you? Focused. Okay. And so if we were to have this same conversation a year from now, and I said, Tony, what was the one word for 2023 to describe that year? What would it be? Dedicated. Okay. Awesome. Focus and dedication, back-to-back years. I think that is, that is awesome. I'm looking forward to you know, hearing more great things. Obviously, we're going to connect outside of this podcast um, continue to help each other, help other people as well continue growing. So I appreciate you for being on here today, Tony. And uh, for listeners, again, make sure you like, follow, and subscribe. Not only me, but also Tony. You know, it's our, I think, uh, mission to really serve you, the community, and help you. And I'm sure that uh, we will have Tony back on again, um, you know, before next year, where he can tell us uh, more about his journey, his path, and where he's gone to. So for all the listeners of the Life Balance Mentor Podcast, thank you very much. And until the next episode. Thank you for listening to Life Balance Mentor Podcast with Kurt Warner. To help create balance in your life, follow me on social media. The links are below in the podcast description. Don't forget to visit the website at lifebalancementor.com. And as always, stay balanced.